Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Sam Anthony. I am the program manager for the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much to, for joining us tonight for our final ballot box basics of 2023. For your awareness, this webinar is being recorded, um, but as an attendee of this webinar, your camera is turned off, so your face will not be included in the recording. A reminder that closed captioning is available in Zoom. To enable closed captions on your screen, you just click Live Transcript on your Zoom taskbar. If you need more assistance with closed captioning, I am also putting a help doc in the chat. If there's anything else that we can do to improve accessibility at this webinar or at future events, please feel free to uh, put your thoughts in the chat or send me an email uh, after the event. We begin our time, this, uh, our time together this evening with a land acknowledgement. Colonial Pennsylvania boundaries were first drawn in 1681 over original nation's land. We in Pennsylvania acknowledge the land ownership of original ind indigenous peoples, honoring the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the great nations of Pennsylvania, the Erie, Iroquois, Muncie, Delaware, Shawnee, Ohio Valley, Susquehannock, and Lenape. We honor all original nations of the past and those among us today. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Our state office oversees an awesome grassroots network of 30 local leagues all across Pennsylvania. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. To learn more about our work and to subscribe to our action alerts, please visit our website. I'll drop the link in the chat as soon as I'm finished the intro. I am very pleased to welcome you tonight to Ballot Box Basics, information every voter needs. We designed these webinars because we know that voting, government, and elections can be complicated. In 2023, these monthly webinars have and will discuss important topics like registering to vote, why municipal elections matter, the rule of school boards and the judiciary, and the Pennsylvania closed primary system. Whether you're a first time voter or have voted in every election you were eligible for, we think you'll find something new. To watch previous recordings of Ballot Box Basics webinars or to sign up for future events in 2024, you can visit the link at our website, which I will also put in the chat. Throughout tonight's presentation, you are welcome and encouraged to ask questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. We will answer as many submitted questions as possible after the presentation. You're welcome to also engage with your fellow participants in the chat, but please note that we will only be answering questions that are, you, that are put in the Q&A tool. In addition to recording, please note that I will also be sending a copy of the slides to all registrants. I will now turn it over to Rochelle Kaplan to introduce our panelists. Panelists, Thanks. excuse me. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Well, you know, Pat Christmas is so talented that he could be two or three panelists at once because he could speak on any subject. I am so delighted to be able to introduce Pat. He's the former chief policy officer for the Committee of 70, where he oversaw the organization's local and state level reform agenda and advocacy strategy, in addition to supporting election programming and communications. Pat served on the election advisory board, which develops recommendations for our general assembly on improvements to our election administration and access to election to voters. I have had the pleasure of working with Pat as part of Ballot PA, which is the coalition of good government groups, which includes obviously the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania to open our primaries to voters who are not affiliated with either major party. Pat has been a tremendous ally and advocate for opening uh, primaries. Before joining 70 in 2013, Pat taught biology and forensic science at the Fells High School at Northeast, Northeast Philadelphia. Last year, Pat gave a ballot box basic presentation on state government. And he was very apologetic that he couldn't get to local government and said, hey, if you wanna do that, I'd be glad to do a presentation on municipal government. So of course, 
we took him off on that great offer. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat. Uh, thank you so much, Ro Rochelle and Sam, and the, and the whole league, uh, you know, career. That's really a generous uh, introduction. And it, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to be back. Um, so, you know, frankly, one of the reasons I enjoy doing these, in, in addition to you know, speaking to a hyper-informed, hyper-engaged group, uh, is because I get to learn something. <laughs> and every time, you know, I try to wrap my head around one of these topics, you know, I pick up, I pick up uh, some some new stuff myself. So, um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to bring up uh, some slides uh, over the next, uh, you know, 25, 30 minutes or so, and then I'm sure we'll have some questions as well. Um, I'll preface this by saying again, you know, I'm I'm learning I'm learning uh, this stuff too, even even as I as I prepare a slide deck, and I'm sure there will be some really really good questions that that I can't answer, and that's awesome. Uh, and if if there's anything here that's that's put out there that we can't answer right now, we'll uh, we'll track those answers down uh, after the uh, uh, after the session. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll start uh, we'll start marching through a little rundown of local government. Which uh, in Pennsylvania is uh, quite quite a story. Um, as an old as an old state, uh, we have old law and we have old structures. Um, and very fortunately, um, you know the 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 real some of the real experts uh, in the in this in this particular field are in one of our state agencies, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of of uh, Community Economic Development, and they actually have a range of really really phenomenal uh, guides. Uh, one of which I just put up the cover here. I think the the most recent one when they did on local government uh, is in, is in twenty eighteen. But this is this is easy to find online, e easy to Google, uh, and I've used it as a resource not just uh, not just to pre prepare this uh, this presentation, but uh, in in the past. So they are they are a phenomenal resource. And um, again, like I like I noted, because this is an old state, uh, this sort of stuff there there's more to cover uh, than there is in uh, in younger younger states. Um, it's it's interesting. There's there's all sorts of stuff that that we in Pennsylvania and some of the um, you not just the Eastern Seaboard but across the Rust Belt uh, structures and mechanisms in government uh, that we have that uh, or don't have uh, that you don't see uh, farther out west. So the the sheer number of municipalities uh, is is one of those. Um, we have two thousand five hundred and sixty ish uh, municipalities, sixty seven counties, and five hundred school districts. Uh, there are there are not too many other states uh, in that universe uh, of local government. Uh, Illinois is is another one, right? So, and Illinois is about far as far west as you'd go, you know, Rust Belt wise, or even like kind of political culture and and structure of government wise. Before you know, beyond that, uh, things change a little bit, and, and not just in terms of structure of government, but even even the the culture the culture of government. Um, the League of Women Voters know, you know knows us well. You know, we do have a a, a culture, a history, a tradition. Uh, as well in Pennsylvania, uh, a political a political corruption, public corruption, uh, and public corruption exists everywhere uh, across the world in every government and every uh, every society. But uh, it seems at times we have a particularly rich tradition and habit of it here here, here in the state, um, and it it is different from other parts of the country. Uh, I mean, Silicon Valley they have their own uh, sorts of, of corruption challenges, but. Uh, you know, this sort of thing, you know, can it travels with people. And so as as um, folks move farther west uh, across Ohio and then uh, oh. eventually again into 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 Illinois, of course, uh, if Philadelphia has a a sister city as far as a, a kind of a public corruption uh, history goes, it's going to be Chicago. Right. And if, as far as Harrisburg has a sister city, as far as state capitals, it's going to be Springfield, uh, Illinois. So, again, Illinois, they are also having a ton of municipalities, um, which we're going to. We're going to walk through some of these basics in, in the coming coming slides, at least the, the basics as to how this works in Pennsylvania, uh, and then have a couple comments in the end about, about what the implications are. Um, there are real implications, real consequences to having this many small local governments. Um, you know, there are implications out west as well to ha for having a whole lot of a whole lot of unincorporated territory, right? Land that's not overseen by a local government, overseen by the county or, or, or even the state or even the federal government. Um, but you know, here in PA, uh, we certainly have a, a pretty acute and, and at times severe set of challenges because uh, uh, because of this arrangement and because of this history, uh, and it is uh, like many things difficult to uh, difficult to change uh, and, uh, and and evolve and, re and reform from. So, um, kind of the the basics of what we're going to overview are the the legal origins uh, for local government for municipal government, uh, and the, and just in a, in a nutshell, what some of the the legal limitations of the legal uh, authorities or powers uh, are. 
Um, those basic structures, the, the the different types of municipalities and the basic services they provide, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, couldn't um, uh, you know go through local government. Even this is not municipal government necessarily, but school districts and, and authorities, municipal authorities, are pretty important in Pennsylvania, uh, as they are in, in uh, across across the whole country. So we'll, we'll touch on those by the end of this presentation as well. Um, so uh, the first question is you know, the origins. Where does this all come from? Uh, local government comes from. You know, the big hint right there in that picture is is the state. Um, you know that's the the Harrisburg Capital Complex. It is it is gorgeous, very impressive. You know, somewhat daunting. I'm sure it was designed it was designed to be imposing. Uh, if you if you, I, I do hope everybody has a chance to go to Harrisburg at some point. You know whether or not that the legislature's in session, do not be intimidated. <laughs> the things the things that are happening inside this there's some there's some great stuff ha that happens within these buildings, of course, and the, then there's some not so great, not so impressive stuff uh, that happens within these buildings. But um, uh, in short, the the reason we can have local government, and this is not just the case here in Pennsylvania, but uh, anywhere in the United States, uh, is because the Constitution uh, allows us to have local government. And then, of course, the, the Pennsylvania Constitution, uh, as our founding and overarching body of law, of course, describes our three branches, right? The Constitution says we have an executive led by the, led by the governor. We have a, a legislative branch, which is our General Assembly, our, our bicameral 253 member uh, General Assembly. And then we have a unified judicial system that spans from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court uh, at the very top of the food chain, that seven member body, uh, all the way down to our, our local courts, our courts of common pleas that are uh, that are countywide. Uh, and then uh, for most of the state, uh, magisterial district courts, um, you know, Allegheny and, and Philadelphia counties being a little bit bigger, do a, a couple things differently. Um, but uh, of course, ac across the state, we have those, uh, or at the state level, we have those three branches. And again, the Constitution and then through the, the General Assembly, through the legislature, they say that Pennsylvanians get to have local government as well uh, of, of certain sorts. So, you know, basically what, what the legislature has done is um, set up a number of different laws that say what local government looks like. And to a great extent, to a very significant extent, extent what local government can do. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the, the, at least the, the one I put up top, this is not just necessarily kind of the most important law, but it's, it's a very significant one, uh, is the home rule charter and optional plans law. Um, and this is, this is significant because, uh, this provides for, um, the citizens in a certain part of the state in a certain community to decide if they want to set up basically their own local government. Uh, and there are dozens and dozens of home rule jurisdictions in Pennsylvania, both municipal home rule jurisdictions and county uh, home rule jurisdictions. Um, and uh, when uh, a group of citizens does this, they set up home rule, um, they have a lot more latitude as to what their local government looks like uh, and and also what it can do. Um, but that's still within the confines of state law and local government being a creature a creature of, uh, of, of the state. So, you know, for example, uh, there are a number of other laws that, that cross uh, all of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a planning code, Right, that has to deal with with zoning and land use ordinances. Uh, I I did list that towards the top because this is this is one of the most consequential and most powerful uh, roles that local government has. Uh, and I'm talking, you know, not just the biggest cities in the Commonwealth, but the smallest the smallest towns uh, and boroughs. This is very very significant. Um, you know, there's their public safety and and uh, emergency management and you know, sewer water on any number of other really critical services that local government provides too. But how we use land is a massive one, um, and yeah, you know, different parts of the state have different challenges. But because land is, of course, scarce, um, and there's going to be demand for that scarce land, how we use it um, has big, big consequences, big implications, not just for the present, uh, but for many, many, many years uh, into the future. So you know, that's a big, big role uh, that love uh, an area in which local government uh, works. Of course, the you know local government again they derive all their power from the state. Uh, they can only tax uh, in a certain way, and that includes uh, school districts, uh, which across most of the state uh, have uh, have taxing authority. Uh, another example I just happened to include on this slide deck was um, you know state law that deals with uh, the sewer system uh, that a given uh, locality that a given municipality has has to set up. So. You know, the the big the big story here is that we only get to have local government because the state says that we do. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that that does come in attention because you do have folks uh, in in uh, uh, certain um, jurisdictions, certain certain communities that want to do things differently than the state says you can. 
Um, and you know, this is a this is actually not something I've worked into the into the slide deck here, but there's a there's a preemption uh, doctrine uh, that that comes up quite frequently, especially uh, I happen to live and work in the city of Philadelphia, and there are any number of things that Philadelphia would like to do. Uh, differently, but the state uh, doesn't allow uh, Philadelphia to do. For example, you know, for example, this is a this is a, a hot topic, um, uh, and uh, uh, one that comes up from time to time with, with regard to guns, gun control, and gun you know gun rights, and what a local jurisdiction like the city of Philadelphia can do within the confines of, of state law. You know, minimum wage is an, is another one that comes up where a given locality may want to, for example, increase the minimum wage, uh, but the state you know, does not want to uh, doesn't want to allow, allow that. So, you know, there are significant limitations uh, for what local governments can and cannot do. Um, but um, you know, there's 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 a, a good bit of latitude over really really important stuff too, um, and whether. Uh, a local jurisdiction is a home rule uh, jurisdiction, or or if it, or if it's not, um, you know, I just mentioned the, the planning again is is a is one of the biggest ones, and certainly has long term consequences for what gets built and what doesn't get built, and who can and who can live where. So um, that's where this all comes from: state law and from our legislature. So with uh, with all that um, uh, through the legislature and through state law, uh, we're able to set up different types. Uh, of local government. So we're going to take a, a brief spin uh, through what some of those local types um, are. Starting with boroughs, right? I just, you know, I mentioned at the outset, we have 2,560 or 60 ish uh, municipalities. Uh, many of those are boroughs, which is one of the smallest units uh, of local government. Um, uh, so in this particular type, you have a borough council uh, that's charged with those basic uh, governance, governance duties. And this includes um, hiring. Uh, the people in local government, and and typically this also includes a manager. Um, it's it's a pretty common feature of local government across the United States to have a, um, you know, I, I think in the in the corporate world or or in the business world, uh, you think of a of a chief uh, operating officer, a COO, COO. So a a borough council uh, is maybe inclined to hire a, a borough manager or a borough COO. Um, even the the biggest jurisdiction, biggest jurisdictions like Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia has a managing director, for example, that's in our charter, uh, basically the COO uh, of the city. So, you know, the borough council hires those hires hires those hires those staff. Um, of course, any local government uh, determining and approving a budget is a big part of the powers, uh, powers and duties, and uh, not just approving. Um, Tax rates and revenue where that where that is allowed, but also the expenses and what gets what gets what, get, what gets paid for, um, and then uh, lastly passing ordinances. Uh, ordinances basically being uh, just local local laws. So you know you're going to see here over the next several slides that there are going to be a lot of a lot of similarities. Um, there's going to be a governing body of some sort, uh, you know, always with a council of some sort. Um, and that council is going to have usually some set of the same same duties. You know, so there's always something that's budget related, right? Power of the power of the purse is supposed to be, you know, at all times kind of close or closest to the to the people and to the voters. Um, so that's going to you know uh, come from a come come from a legislature, and then to pass laws, of course, that should also be as close to the people as possible. You know, through your elected representatives uh, on a on a council. So. Um, you know, at this level and at the other levels, you know, state law will prescribe to some extent um, what that structure looks like, even within the council. So, you know, for example, um, a, a borough uh, that's not divided into wards uh, will have three, five, or seven members. Right? That's a that's a limitation. That's a prescription that is uh, that is in state law. Um, for for some boroughs that are divided into wards, and I guess in the, in this case, you can think about wards as you know, uh, not political political wards. I know as we have in the city of Philadelphia, but you know, this similar to legislative districts, right? We have house districts, we have state senate districts uh, at the at the state level in the general assembly. In this case, we're talking about you know ward districts for the sake of municipal governance, for the sake of bureau of borough uh, governance. So you know, in this case, state law provides for it prescribes um, uh, boroughs that that are divided into wards. Uh, how many um, uh, uh, borough council members have can be elected? Uh, from each of those wards, one, two, or three. Uh, and then again, prescribed by state law, uh, borough council members are elected uh, to four-year terms, but they are staggered, right? Which uh, is pretty typical uh, across legislative bodies uh, in most in most of the country, um, where that those staggered terms help, help ensure some degree of, of continuity, right? Where you don't have everybody turning over uh, in one, one election cycle, 
you know, half or a third of those folks will turn over. Uh, the other folks will stick around for the other half or, or two thirds or third of their, their terms, right? And, and at the state level or at the federal level, uh, we have staggered terms too. You know, typically in, a, in, a, in our American bicameral legislatures, it's that house where there's the most turnover, turnover right? Usually a two-year two term. Uh, and then in, in, in many state senates, including Pennsylvania's, there's a four-year term, but those are those are staggered to, create, to provide some degree uh, of stability, just like, of course, in Congress, right, two-year House, U.S. House terms, and then six-year uh, U.S. Uh, Senate terms. So, um, you know, there's your borough council, your local legislature, uh, and then there is going to be a mayor, right, that, ex that executive even at the at the most hyper-local level, um, and with some very kind of, again, basic, basic duties. Public safety is going to be one of the most uh, common or most common and most important, of course, uh, overseeing the police force, you know, to the extent necessary, declaring uh uh, emergencies overseeing emergency management, which which can include uh, you know nine one one services, uh, and then in most cases the mayor has veto power over um, uh, over ordinances, right? Just like any other relationship between uh, a legislature and an executive. So all those checks and balances are supposed to be you know pretty well baked in there. Uh, in this case, you know into into state law as to how this thing is is set up. Um, you know the other feature here that is at the borough level, but that you're going to see across the other levels is um and uh well a collection a tax collection a funding collection uh position typically a, a tax a tax collector um and then uh, an audit function um an audit function that's going to reside in, in this case within the borough uh borough type of government either a board of auditors or a controller um or an appointed uh, certified public uh, public accountant and and you know i there surely there's some nuances and pros and cons to each of those different um different types but the base the basic need here is that someone has to prepare your your basic financial statements uh for the borough council and for the mayor to, to review for the public to review uh, and then of course there does have to be uh, an, an an annual audit of some sort to make sure that the money is going where it's supposed to go um and being used what it's supposed to be used for so you know i spend just a a, a little bit longer on this first slide uh with our bur with our borough uh uh set up um uh, the smallest level, because you'll see um, some consistencies here across the other types uh, of local government. So with that, uh, let's move on to um, the the biggest biggest level. Uh, although there's there even here in this case, there's a there's a lot of range between uh, the biggest cities and the smallest cities. So starting with third class cities. Again, all set, all set according to, to state law uh, that that the Pennsylvania legislature ha has passed. Um, in this case, third class cities uh, they do have an elected mayor, and then you know anywhere between four and six uh, council council persons. Some are elected at large, uh, some are elected by uh, by legislative by legislative ward. Uh, and again, just like you saw with with the boroughs, even in a, in a third class city, um, public safety is a major uh, uh, duty of the mayor. Uh, and uh, enforcing uh, enforcing ordinances, making sure they're making sure they're followed, but of course having that veto power over ordinances as well that are passed by city council. And again, just like I mentioned, um, you know, there's going to be a a treasurer or tax collector uh, function, right, to collect whatever revenue is a, is lawful at, at that level. Um, and if this, I guess this is another hot topic here in Pennsylvania, as in most places. Property taxes is going to be the, the main revenue stream for almost every uh, every uh, local government. So you know, whether it's your tax collector or your elected treasurer, in this case, will collect those property taxes. Um, and then there will be, in this case, for third class third class cities at least, there's a, an, an elected controller uh, who conducts the audits. Um, so uh, I should have mentioned in here somewhere in this deck, like the number of um, uh, the number of jurisdictions for each each kind of class. Uh, but again, just knowing knowing that the overall number is 2,560-ish, uh, we're talking, you know, for some of these levels, it's hundreds of jurisdictions that, in a given class, and others, it's, it's scores, uh, scores or dozens, um, with the exception of, um, you know, we have second-class cities that are listed here, too, um, and then first-class cities. This is where things get very, very specific. Um, so, you'll, so you'll see under the second-class uh, and second class A city uh, line here, we're, we're just looking at two cities, um, Pittsburgh and Scranton. Pittsburgh being a second class city, the only second class city, and Scranton being the only second class A city. Each of them also happen to have uh, home, rule, uh, home rule charters. Um, again, still, like you're going to have your local executive and your local, your local legislature, uh, a mayor who's going to oversee um, the personnel, 
in our operations of uh, of city government. Again, having a budgetary power, having a having a veto function uh, in the legislative process, um, and then according to the the home rule charters that were passed by uh, the folks in these cities. Um, they have councils too, a nine, nine member council in Pittsburgh, a five member council in Scranton. But um, this is, you know, this is where things get awfully narrow and awfully specific, where again, you have hundreds or at least scores of other jurisdictions of the other class types. Uh, but at, at the second class level, it gets very, very specific. And then lastly, uh, of the first class cities and first class counties, uh, Philadelphia is the, is the only one. Um, first class cities having populations of more than 1 million people. Uh, of course, that is only the, the city and county of Philadelphia. Um, any law, uh, and there are a number of different laws uh, at the state level that refer to first class uh, cities, first class counties, counties, those laws are o only um, you know targeted towards uh, Philadelphia, just like there are certain laws that name specifically first, second class or second class A cities. Of course, you know, when those when the lawmakers and the, when the staffers are drafting the legislation, they mention those terms. Uh, you know, we know specifically and exactly what cities they're they're referring to. Um, and, and at the you know at the first class city level, again, only being Philadelphia, another it's another home rule jurisdiction. Uh, Philadelphia's home rule charter, uh, the one we're we're living with right now, it's about seventy years old. That was passed in 1951. We have an, an elected mayor and a 17 uh, member council. So, you know, this is um, this is I think this is uh, pretty, pretty um, uh, consistent where across most of our home rule uh, jurisdictions, they tend to be the larger, the more populous, uh, the more populous parts of the state. Um, the less popular, less populous part, parts of the state, I think, tend to have fewer, uh, fewer home rule jurisdictions. But, you know, being being most familiar with Philadelphia, you know, I think there's there's of course very strong arguments that that were made in the mid 20th century, and very strong arguments that we would still have to this day about why a place is as big as Philly or places as big as Pittsburgh, or Scranton, or any number of the other um, home rule jurisdictions. You know, why those places they they would want to have far more latitude as to how they set up um, their uh, their local government, how they set up their mayor, the mayor's powers, how they set up their council, uh, the council's powers. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, one, I guess, funny little uh, wrinkle, although this may not be funny, this may not be a wrinkle, depending on who you're <laughs> who you're speaking to. Uh, in Philadelphia, you know, most recently, not just this election cycle, but in the past couple election cycles, um, you know, there's been a, uh, a tension, and that's, that's probably putting it pretty lightly at this point, between the uh, most of the Democratic Party establishment and Working Families Party. Uh, candidates and supporters, um, because Philadelphia's home rule charter, again, set up in 1951, provided for and, and only could have contemplated two major parties um, that were vying for uh, vying for elections. And then, you know, that's this is another uh, challenge, I think, that certainly is not specific to Phil. This is this is, you know, uh, I'd say I'd say pretty broad based across most of the state where, you know, these government structures and certainly the, the electoral piece of, of local government uh, not to mention state left government was set up when you know the state was far more purple. Uh, the Democratic Party uh, was substantial and had a lot of people across the state. The Republican Party uh, was substantial and had a lot of people across the state. Now both of those major parties are still substantial, of course, but in 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 fewer and fewer communities do you have both Democrats and Republicans living together. So you know I think this is this is also playing out um, uh, in in many places where. Previously, you would have had Democrats and Republicans running in their own primaries, right? And whoever wins those primaries then goes off to the general election. You have Democrats and Republicans com competing against each other. Um, that is less and less the case uh, today. And, you know, sometimes there, there are significant policy implications uh, for those partisan dynamics. Uh, in, other in other cases, you know, not, not so much. Um, you know, it is true. It is absolutely true that local government uh, is, is less partisan uh, than than the state level or the federal level, they're just they're fewer ideological dimensions of of you know maintaining the streets, filling in the pothole, picking up the trash. Uh, it's hard to get too ideological about about serve government services like that. Um, but uh, there are there's a lot of stuff that local government does, and there's certainly some ideological you know back and forth and tension and even battling over um, control of local government and, and certain policies uh, that are passed or, or not passed. So again, I you know with in Philadelphia, for example, and this is what I, I was bringing up out of the at least out of Philly's home rule. Um, for many many years, uh, we have seven at large members, um, and uh, because Philly has been a dominant you know, Democratic stronghold for a long time, of those seven at large members, 
Uh, five, no more than five can be of the same party. Of course, the, the Democrats have easily won those five, those five seats. And then the Republicans take the leftovers. They take, they, they take the other two, you know, given our, our current home rule structure, um, it doesn't have to be the Republican party. It doesn't have to be that minor part, that minority party that gets those other two seats. It could be another party. So, you know, we've had for, for one four year term here, a, a working families party council member, uh, who was able to beat out a Republican in the last cycle, uh, and now we have uh, another, you know, pretty tense election cycle where working family party, working families party candidates and supporters are battling not just against Republican candidates and supporters, but against you know a decent swath of the Democratic establishment uh, for those last two seats. So you know, I just I, I mentioned that, and, and and because you know that particular arrangement, that particular part of our council structure, ten district and seven at large, that's in our charter. Um, and I think it'll probably be worth a conversation at some point, maybe sooner rather than later uh, here in Philly, about what our charter says about how council set up. Um, and I'm sure there, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we see, you know, similar discussions taking place uh, in other parts of the state, especially those parts of the state uh, that are either heavily Republican or heavily Democrat. Um, you know, I mentioned at the outset, of course, state law providing or putting in place a lot of restrictions on how certain things work. Uh, elections is is one of those areas. As as Rochelle and a number of the other our, our league uh, you know partners and friends are on the line are, are aware of. You know, state law is pretty script, prescriptive about how elections are run. Um, but for home rule jurisdictions, at least, uh, there is some latitude about how you can how you can set up um, your government. And therefore, you know what people are voting for necessarily uh, in a given a given election cycle. So, anyway, there are all sorts of implications to to how this stuff is set up. Um, you know, both at the borough, city, and then next slide here, I believe, is for for townships, uh, of which there are uh, are hundreds. So, um, you know, we just we've kind of been through a couple times here. Uh, you know, you have your governing body. So in this case, not a council, but a board of commissioners that that uh, are the main governing body for a given township. Um, and that's, you know, passing uh, ordinances, uh, overseeing township operations, again, usually hiring um, uh, a COO or manager type figure to actually kind of, you know, deliver services. Uh, and then again, you'll see your, you'll, your, your, you'll see your tax collector or treasurer type position uh, to collect revenue. Um, and to uh, yeah, make sure it's uh, uh, make sure it's dispersed properly, and then again, you have your audit or, or controller function uh, for your uh, uh, for your township. So again, multiple classes here, slightly different arrangements um, uh, depending on on the class. Uh, all again, all all set at state, all set at, at the state level. So you know, despite uh, this is where like I've done I've done some learning on my part too, even just going through um, DCED's uh, you know guide here. It's a little dizzying at first to see all these different arrangements, all these different types, uh, and then even within the different types, cities, townships, um, I guess not boroughs, but the cities and townships for sure, the different classifications within them. Uh, but you do see the same fundamentals right throughout. There's usually there's an executive of some shape or form. There's always a legislature of some shape or form. There's a tax collection and, and kind of tax holding fund holding position of some sort. And then there's an auditing uh, position of some sort. Um, you know, most of those positions, certainly the most important or most fundamental positions are usually elected, uh, elected directly by the voters. Uh, there are going to be an, a lot of other positions uh, that are not that are excuse me that are appointed, um, but others that that are elected and maybe arguably should not be elected. Um, and uh, actually, you know, we'll get we'll get to those in just another another slide or two. Um, uh, before I do that, I guess just a, a quick rundown on, man, all the services that that local government provides. Uh, this is it, there's a lot here. Um, and uh, as you as you might be wondering um, already, just given the walkthrough of the different types of, of local government that, that I mentioned at the outset, you know, not every local government provides all this stuff. Right. Uh, you know, a, a small uh, or smallish borough uh, with a relatively small number of people, like let's, let's call it several thousand uh, people, several thousand taxpayers. Right. Is not going to be able, be able to provide all these all these services. Um, in, in fact, across much of the state, uh, some of the stuff, a lot of the stuff is covered at the county level. Right. Our 67 county governments um, are, are also kind of a, a really important piece of how how this works. Um, but this is where, of course, and, you know, the League of Women Voters has been doing this for decades and decades and decades, you know, getting voters to understand man, it's not just president. It's not just voting for, for your governor. It's voting for your local elected officials. Um, 
and and who they are, how qualified they are, how much integrity they have um, is really important because um, you know some of these things uh, will impact us on a daily basis. Other 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 these things, not just on a daily basis, uh, but many but many years into the future, including again, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna keep calling out the land use piece of this just because you know land use is um, is one where. Uh, there's not just, you know, it seems to me some growing tension and discussion and debate uh, in PA, but there's certainly been this in other parts of the country, certainly those other parts of the country that have become, uh, for many people, prohibitively expensive. Uh, California may well be at the, at the top of that list uh, for that, how they've handled, uh, how, they, how they've handled their, uh, their, their land. So, um, you know, all sorts of stuff here. And again, it's going to differ a little bit um, from, from, uh, you know, this part of the state to that part of the state based on the size and the size of the, of the municipality uh, and then what the county government is going to uh, is going to provide. But it is it is a lot. Uh, so I mentioned uh, county government uh, several times here. We have our, our 67 counties uh, across the Commonwealth um, and and almost all of them, not every single one, but many of them are, are overseen by three county commissioners and they're elected to four year terms. Uh, all uh, concurrently, all at the same time. Uh, this uh, this election cycle, this 2023 election cycle, happens to be um, one of those years in which we are electing uh, electing county commissioners, um, and they have broad powers. Um, right, you don't see a mayor listed here, but the county commissioners both have uh, that executive function, uh, and that they'll uh, uh, they'll hire, they'll appoint a number of really key um, officials, key administrators, key bureaucrats to run and oversee county government. Uh, but then they'll have, um, you know, a, a kind of a quasi judicial function over certain things and even a, a legislator, a legislative or quasi legislative function in, in passing, passing local, uh, local ordinances. So, you know, just to give an example of that, um, you know, what I mean by quasi judicial function is uh, elections. Right. Elections are um, set at the state level through our Pennsylvania election code, um, and that's where most of the rules are set. Um, but the counties are the local government unit. They're responsible for actually running elections. So when you see uh, elections listed there in, in the bulleted list, uh, there's a, a county board of elections that, again, not every of our 67 counties has, but um, in the same way. Uh, but in most counties, it's it's the three county commissioners who oversee on that county board of elections. And the, the quasi judicial functions that, that they have, the decision making power that they have includes, you know, determining when polling places need to be changed and voting on that, um, voting to certify the election. One of the maybe, you know, one of the most important things that they do um, and uh, something that hopefully will be done smoothly, not just this year, but next year in 2024. Um, they'll determine uh, where, where necessary, whether or not to count someone's absentee or mail-in ballot or the provisional ballot, right? If, if there's kind of a, a, a tough call or borderline call that makes not clear cut, um, those sorts of decisions come before the County Board of Elections where they vote, again, to count someone's ballot or not not count someone's uh, you know, ballot, depending on what the, you know, depending on what the, uh, what the issue is. That, that includes, for example, in the past, in the recent past, um, if someone has not uh, used the secrecy envelope, or if they've not signed the outer envelope, uh, you know, as the county board of elections has to take that final vote and and not count uh, ballots of, of that sort. So, you know, that's I guess that's maybe that's probably a good example of a, a more of a specialized area where most of that function is set at the state level. But you know, the county commissioners they they will hire an elections director, and then elections director will hire will hire deputies. Uh, they will run the elections, but then the three commissioners will sit on the county board and have those those special duties that state law uh, provides for. Um, this can be a little bit different based on based on the other areas. You know, some of these some of these other um, areas that are that are I think more purely administrative or ministerial. You know, prisons, emergency management, waste disposal, and, and recycling, um, uh, social services. I think that you know typically your county commissioners will again they'll they'll hire they'll appoint bureaucrats they'll hire administrators to run those to run those services. Um, I, you know, there's, there's a, another bullet here, the court system, you know, the court of complies, the, the, in our magisterial district courts across the Commonwealth, those, um, despite being listed here as at the kind of, at the county level, those are not, of course, overseen, uh, by the county commissioners. We want to want to have a good, healthy, uh, separation of, of branches here, separation of powers, the court system, uh, up and down, uh, our unified judiciary, um, is, is separate. So the county court of common pleas and our magisterial district, magisterial district courts, Although being at the local level, you know those are part of the of the state's unified judicial branch, uh, and the rules for how those operate both come from state law and from uh, come from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. 
So, you know, again, a range of different functions here, all, all very, very important. Um, and the county commissioners oversee and, and appoint uh, those administrators who, who actually do the work, the operational work uh, kind of day in, uh, day in and day out. So you'll see like, you know, or, you, or you, I guess you can see there's some degree of, of over, overlap here. Um, between you know those critical functions that the counties provide uh, and that uh, and that municipalities provide kind of under uh, underneath them. I'll go although you'll see like you know the the public safety, police, and fire are not listed here. The policing, you know, if if a if a municipality does have a police function, it's it's typically uh, typically at that uh, at that level. Um, the uh, the only counties that would not have your three county commissioner set up here are those uh, those counties that are that are home rule um, and there are. Oof, off the top of my head, there are more. There, there are more. There are more than a few uh, county governments with uh, with home rule, home rule, home rule jurisdiction. Again, the the bigger counties tend to be home rule. The Lafayette County, uh, you know, Allegheny County, Lehigh County, um, but uh, but not all of them. So uh, all important stuff here. Um, and uh, here we go. This is what I was thinking about a, a couple a couple uh, a couple slides ago. So again, this is like bread and butter for the League of Women Voters. Um, it is really hard to keep track of all your local local officials and all the different aspects uh, of local government. As as critical as local government is to uh, to regular Pennsylvanians, as, as as direct as an impact and as regular as an impact as it has uh, on our daily lives, um, to keep track of who your mayor is, uh, or even who your council members are, who your borough council members are, who your city council members are, you know, is I think more doable for the typical voter. Um, but uh, as you go through the rest of these offices here, it gets harder and harder, right? The, every county has a district attorney. Uh, that is another very, very high profile position. I mean, everybody should know who the district attorney is and what the district attorney does uh, in their county. You know, controller uh, in those places and in most places where, where it is elected, that is also pretty, pretty high level. Um, but I'd say like there's a there's a bit of a, um, a gap uh, that starts to form between DA, controller, you know, treasurer, you know, may may or may not be known. Sheriff may or may not be known at the at the county level. And then they're going to have a whole bunch of other offices here, uh, elected elected offices, mind you, um, that the, the voters are just not going to know very much about. Um, you know, obviously, like most folks are not going to go not not going to know who their current coroner is, their prothonotary, register of wills. I mean, the yeah, you know, I think what's important to stress here is that the functions that are listed here are really important. Um, and that, that have to be provided uh, at the at the local level, right? These are obviously not not federal functions. These are these are not state level functions either. Uh, even if some of these some of these offices uh, operate within state law, the sheriff's an example, register of wills an example, district attorney as an example. Uh, these are still all local, you know, local functions that local officials should be uh, should be handling. Um, but you know, whether or not they should be elected. Uh, is another question altogether. Uh, and again, having just lived and lived and worked in Philly for a while, you know, I'm most familiar with in the city of Philadelphia, where we have several of these positions that are that are still elected, where it, it can be challenging or even problematic, uh, where the elected official is not a is not a high, high profile position, it's not even a, a, a mid profile position, is a very very low profile position. Most people don't even know that they, that such a position exists. Um, and of course, if there's another kind of fundamental in government and fundamental fundamental in government accountability, it's that you know if folks don't know that the person don't know that the office exists, you know they certainly can't be held accountable um, for when things are not working the way they're supposed to, or even if something bad happens, uh, how to hold uh, that particular position that position accountable. So you know in the in the committee of seventies, uh, you know hum humble view, you know many of these positions should not be elected uh, elected at all. Uh, they should be appointed, you know either. Uh, through uh, through the court system, through the judiciary, if it's a judicial related function, you know the clerk of courts, the prothonotary would be probably be good examples of that. Board of board of jury commissioners, perhaps, um, but then some of these others could be appointed by whatever the governing body is, the, either the mayor or the council or a combination uh, of the mayor uh, and the council, and they don't have to be directly appointed, directly elected by uh, by the voters. So yeah, if if you're wondering, man, that's 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 a long list. Uh, it is a long list. Uh, and in, in other parts of the country, uh, you don't have quite so many uh, elected officials who uh, who are directly elected and have very specific, uh, very specific duties here. Again, another example, like farther out west, it is much more common at the county level to have a recorder um, or or like a recorder dash clerk, a recorder clerk. Uh, and that that office 
is higher profile and it'll, it'll have several duties, several duties bundled together, like a recorder clerk out West, you know, may, may do tax collection. It may do, um, it may over, you know, oversee elections and it may have a, have a, a register of wills or a, or a property, um, record or property documentation function. So, you know, it, several of these, um, functions may be rolled up into one office, uh, and, uh, that can arguably be a good thing in that it becomes a bigger and a high, higher profile office, right? That, again, consequently, the voters can know a little bit more about, know a little bit more who they're voting for, and then be in a little bit better position, uh, to hold, uh, hold that office and hold that official, uh, accountable. But yeah, this is, uh, uh this is the way things were set up uh, a, a while ago. And I guess, I think we could all probably easily imagine why, yeah, at one point it seemed like a really good idea. Let's have the people vote directly on this stuff, vote directly on who their elected officials are, uh, and that may have worked reasonably well uh, at one point or even for a time. Um, but you know, today, uh, all sorts of reasons why this does not work uh, very well. And I think there are actually even a couple of positions here, uh, local positions that uh, that are elected. I, I didn't even squeeze on, onto the list, and that you'll see, you know, you'll see from time to time, um, and maybe even more from time to time across the Commonwealth, like uh, news stories will pop up where uh you know some very very small and low profile elected position like something has not gone the right the way it's supposed to in fact something has gone very very badly because of uh uh because of what something you know, someone has done or done or not done um you know and actually maybe maybe on that point i'll make a an, an ad hoc plug here uh on for supporting uh local journalism local local journalists um this this problem and this challenge in a state like Pennsylvania is 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 more severe. It's compounded by the fact that, you know, when you have all this all this this uh, kind of fragmented uh, local government, and when you don't even have um, uh, a robust local paper uh, to cover what's happening, that makes it even harder uh, to hold your local government accountable and, and for folks to do uh, what they're supposed to do in the in these positions. So, um, you know, unfortunately, this is this is a, and this is a relatively you know new challenge. I mean, these offices have been on the books for for decades and decades. Uh, but the decimation of the of the news industry has certainly made this a lot, lot harder. Um, so you'll see, you know, scandals or, or or headlines here and there about you know offices like this and and something that's that that's bad or hasn't hasn't gone off the right way. Uh, and and surely, surely we're not we're not even getting um, maybe even a fraction of the stories that we should be getting uh, about these offices. Both both the you know the, not just the bad stuff, but the the good the good stuff uh, the good stuff too. So. You know, we do have our work cut out cut out for us uh, here uh, in the Commonwealth on that front. Um, okay, I'm going to be wrapping it up here because I realize we covered a lot of ground. And a very quickly, school districts and authorities. Um, we do have elected elected school school boards across most of the state. Again, we have 500 school districts. Uh, Pennsylvania or Philadelphia, I believe, is the only uh, jurisdiction that does not have an elected board. Um, very very important. Of course, has become very very controversial uh, in in recent years um, uh, because of uh, 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 school district education policy and the sort of books, I suppose, and curricula in, to, in some respect, in some respect, except in my, in my view, some of this, um, some of this has taken up uh, more oxygen than, than it should compared to, you know, making sure our, our buildings are safe, that teachers are, are, are recruited and, and well-paid, you know, those, those really, really critical, uh, you know, aspects of, of public education that we're still really, uh, really struggling to, uh, uh, to take care of well, but um, uh these elected members will oversee again all of those functions, not just um, uh, the administration, taxes, you know, labor agreements sometimes, uh, but of course they'll hire their the CEO, COO uh, or the, the superintendent of the district, uh, and then in in and pretty much all cases will um, uh, determine the property tax rates too. Again, another kind of hot hot topic. So um, I'll I'll leave that there because we uh, we're kind of we're starting to run out of time here. But school districts being um, a really critical piece of a local government. And then municipal authorities is the other piece. And again, it's another one that probably doesn't get you know, half as much attention or even a much, a much, a much smaller fraction than, uh, of, of attention than, than what it, what it deserves. Um, in a nutshell, authorities are, are things, they're legal entities that are created uh, for very specific projects, either to finance, to pay for those projects or to operate uh, those, those projects. Um, and by, by public works projects, we're talking, you know, Everything there listed under functions, parking, airport, transit, economic development, water, sewer, stormwater, business district. There are, there are, um, there are a handful of others, uh, you know, not, not listed there. Um, but 
these these municipal authorities, I mean, they're not always needed. And we certainly, you know, there's certainly authorities out there that probably have, have been set up and have, that have outlived their their usefulness, or that maybe that maybe even that weren't needed in the first place. Um, but in 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 many respects, these author the, the authority uh concept and mechanism is really, really valuable, especially when uh you're gonna set something up that's gonna be really costly. And it's going to be really costly in the long in the long term, uh, but it's also going to have long term uh, long term value. So, um, you know, public infrastructure is is one of the most basic examples of this, right? When you're, you know, when you're uh, building a a water or a sewer system, for example, right? You don't want to pay for all that like right up in front, right? Most people don't pay for their house uh, all up in one uh, all up in one go. You 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 set something up so that you can pay for uh, that project in the long term. Uh, through some sort of rate or some some sort of fee fee structure, and then further, um, you know, you, you'd probably think about, or maybe if you see the logos down there, um, there are some authorities that are confined within a within a local jurisdiction within a county, and then there are plenty of authorities authorities that cross lines. Um, water and sewer systems can cross local lines, can cross county lines. SEPTA, obviously, right, is a is a is a, is a five county uh, five county enterprise. Um, airport authorities. Um, uh, can can go across go across lines. So it, it is especially helpful not just when you're financing something that's going to be pretty costly, but only in the long run. And so you want to have like a long term um, cost and revenue structure for for paying whatever that thing is, especially if you if you got to build it and maintain it. Um, but if it's a if it's a function that's going to be shared across multiple local governments, multiple not just municipalities, but multiple multiple counties, um, you know, an authority is something that that you want to you want to set up. Um, and then naturally, I think it makes some sense that, you know, there has there does have to be a governing body for this thing that's going to span multiple local jurisdictions. Uh, and that governing body can be can be set up different ways. But, the you know, basically those local governments that decided to set it up in the first place, you know, they get appointments uh, to that entity. Just like, again, you know, I'll just call out SEPTA as one of the big, big, biggest examples in the state. Um, you know, SEPTA is a regional five county uh, enterprise, five county authority. So there are appointments across uh, all five uh, counties um, that are served by uh, that transit agency. Uh, and this uh, this is the last um, uh, last little point uh, I was going to make here. Last slide. Um, as far as the implications of having all of these um, uh, municipalities, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. In fact, again, more than almost two thousand six hundred of them. Um, the uh, the financial and the operational stresses on many of these local governments um, can be pretty severe, and it be it can become and it has been. Um, uh, even harder where, you know, communities and, and economies are not stable and they they change and in parts of the state where the economy has deteriorated or withered away or, or, or weakened uh, for any number of reasons and not and not reasons that are that are because of the people who live there, but just, you know, economies change. Uh, and when economies change, uh, you know, factories or mines wind down or close down, for example, the tax base shrink, people move away, businesses move away. And you got a government set up and services that are supposed to be provided, but with less money to pay for it. Um, and uh, that um, uh, that is kind of the, the basic part of the basic uh, tension and basic stressor that is on a lot of um, uh, local governments where the tax base is not as strong as it used to be. And it is much harder to maintain that government and to maintain those services uh, into the future. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the pension liabilities, just just for one uh uh, one example, you know, can put a lot of strain on, on a local government where the tax base is not what it not what it used to be. So, um, uh, the Pennsylvania Economy League actually has a similar kind of progressive era history um, to uh, the League of Voters and 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 uh, the Committee of Seventy has been working on this for many 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 years. Uh, the Pennsylvania Municipal League is kind of like the tr a trade association uh, for our municipal governments, and and these are issues where they have a great deal of expertise. Uh, they probably they surely don't have. You know, a fraction of the capacity they, you know, that those organizations could use to support um, our municipalities to to uh, to address the challenges that, that they have. Um, but this is the sort of stuff that they focus on uh, day in and, and day out, um, both directly to municipalities and whatever challenges they're dealing with, and, and trying to work through our legislature. Since again, right, this 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 brings it all home. All the, all these all these local governments are creatures of the state. Um, you know, some of these challenges have to be addressed in state law. Um, 
how local governments are set up and how where especially they're distressed especially financially distressed uh what their what their options will be which could include mergers and consolidations which of course would would not be easy in fact in many cases they're quite challenging or, or even painful so uh with that uh covered a lot more covered a lot more ground than i anticipated and and, and spoke much for but I, I hope uh this was a, a a very quick um but uh, uh look at, at local government and all the um facets uh that, that go into this uh this piece of pennsylvania thank you so much thank you so much pat um i love these webinars i always learn something new which is really exciting especially since we have local elections coming up um so thank you so much um we have a couple of minutes for questions um if you have a question please put it in the q a uh, section of the chat i have a couple right here the first one um, and this is a question I also had, is what and who determines whether a city is first, second, second A, or third class? And my also addition to that question is, can the statuses change? They can. Um, I think for, for all three of those, it's, it's going to be um, based on population. Um, so for cities, cities of the first class, for example, uh, only cities with more than, more than a million people, which is only going to be Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. All right. And so then it would change with the population. All it right. Could. That makes sense. It could. Okay. And that, that's in the state law that says that, right? Correct. Gotcha. Um, and then there was a, a clarification in the chat um, from one of our attendees, which is that they thought that second class townships have supervisors rather than commissioners. Is there a difference? Yeah, good question. And you're right. There, there are there are absolutely township supervisors. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I'd have to get I'd have to get clarity myself on that. Why in some some certain some certain circumstances, jurisdictions, there are township supervisors. The other in other cases, they'd have a they'd have a, a board of commissioners. But that is that's absolutely correct, Matthew. Uh, in many places, maybe even most places, either it's township supervisors who, who play that role at that level. Um, and then I just have a you know, depending on time. I think we have time for one more. Um, and this might be more of like a Philadelphia specific question, um, but, you know, I was wondering how how often is the home rule charter actually successfully changed, would you say? Oh, ch changed on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> well, in Philadelphia, we we amend our charter all the time. Um, right. And uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe had, some, had some insight into this. Yeah, Philadelphia's Home Rule Charter was a, was adopted uh, and approved by the voters in 1951. It, you know, it makes sense that any any part of, any part of Pennsylvania that has a Home Rule Charter it was it was approved by you know, the citizens of, of that of that community. And um, there was a for a 70 year period with our with our Home Rule Charter here in Philly. Um, it wasn't it wasn't changed very often, but there was a there was an acceleration of amendments starting in the early 2000s. Um, for a number of different reasons, I think part of it was the, the relationship between the mayor and the, and the city council at that time. Um, and some of these amendments are very much needed. Um, but something else has happened is our, our council members have realized it's really easy to stick a, a proposed amendment onto the ballot. And it's a ballot question. Everybody gets a C. Voters almost always approve them. And it's just it seems like a little bit too easy to do, um, at least at least in Philly. We were amending the charter. Yeah. Before. I, I feel like it's on every single election. I have some question that I have to like look up what the implications are. Um, and I know it's different for every municipality, but we were talking about how some of the charter maybe should be changed, but hasn't yet, which is a deeper conversation than we have time for right now, I think. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. Uh, if anybody has questions after the fact, you can feel free to email me and I can connect you with Pat who will be able to answer them better than I could. Um, but for the time being, I am going to turn it over to Colleen to close this out. I just want to say thank you so much, Pat. We, I, I also learned a lot from this. Uh, and I'm sure everyone else did. So thank you for your time. I know you're here purely as a volunteer, um, as everyone else is. Um, this concludes, just for the general group, our ballot box basics uh, programming for this fall. Um, so in December, January time frame, we start putting together the bell box basic topics for the next uh, fall. So um, if there are ideas that you have, please email me or Rochelle Kaplan. And Rochelle also wants to me to give you her 
Great, great. Thanks, Pat. And um, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night.